This is why we constantly thank God. Because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is, the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea since you have also suffered the same things from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone by keeping us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. As a result, they are constantly filling up their sins to the limit, and wrath has overtaken them at last. But as for us... Brothers and sisters, after we were forced to leave you for a short time, in person, not in heart, we greatly desired and made every effort to return and see you face to face. So we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. This is the word of the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, before we get started tonight, we want to praise you and we want to thank you that through your suffering on the cross, through your suffering to death, through persecution, you were pierced for our transgressions. Thank you that we can be saved and that we can be counted as your children. Lord, please fill our lowly hearts tonight with awe and fear and wisdom to apply what we learn tonight. Break down any rebel force that remains and resist your holy wall as we listen, study, and apply your word in our own lives in a way that is worthy of the calling until you come. Amen. Well, let's hope this works tonight. Our uh, first uh, the, the book of Thessalonians, basically the theme is until he comes. That's the, the title of the series. And the main point of Paul's letter, this first letter to the young church of Thessalonica is living with hope until he comes. And so to, to amplify what, we will be, what I will be preaching about tonight, I want us to read Romans 5, verse 3 to 5, where Paul describes suffering. He says, not only that. But we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. So in a way, if you follow the logic, it seems that we can do this. You take hope out, and you replace it with suffering. Because if you just, as we just read, suffering and hope is very closely related And suffering actually precedes hope. And that is what 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13 to 20 is all about. Living for Christ until he comes is worth the suffering. Living for Christ until he comes is worth the suffering. And if we look at our text tonight, we can actually break it down into three sections. First section is proclaiming the gospel leads to suffering. Resisting the gospel leads to wrath, and living the gospel leads to glory. I'm wondering, what do these people have in common? That's Jim Elliott, <clears throat> Richard Wormbrand, and the Geneva Presbyterian Church. Just a little over 66 years ago, on January 8, 1956, Jim Elliott and his four friends, Nate, Ed, Peter, and Roger, were all speared to death on a sandbar called Palm Beach in the Kurarai River in Ecuador. They were trying to reach the Huarani Indians for the first time in history of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Richard Wormbrand was an evangelical Luther pastor of Jewish origin who was born in 1909 in Romania. And when the communist seized his native land in 1945, he became the leader in the underground church in 1948. 
And he and his wife, Sabina, were arrested. And he served 14 years in red prisons, including three years in solitary confinement in a subterranean cell underneath the ground, never seeing the sun, never seeing the stars, and never seeing flowers or smelling them. He saw no one except his guard and his torturers until Christian friends in Norway purchased his freedom for $10,000 in 1964. And then, just last Sunday, the Geneva Presbyterian Church in Laguna Woods, 1 p.m. last week, California time, the members of the church were enjoying a lunch banquet after their church service, and then a gunman opened fire in the church, killing one, and injuring five. The cause is still unknown, the police say. Church goers overpowered the thug and and, um, and caught him. But still one person died and five were injured. May 16, 2022, less than seven days ago. Were they persecuted for their faith? No one knows at this stage. The truth will prevail one day and the Christian And Christian persecution may well be the reason. The question still remains, was it senseless or did it serve a greater purpose? But for that answer, we will have to wait until until the Lord comes. Because sometimes persecution and suffering for Christ is not as clear as in the first two cases. But because Jim Elliott and Richard Wormbrand has passed from this world to the next, I think both of them will agree that living for Christ is tough, but it's worth the suffering until he comes. And so similar to our first two examples, we will learn tonight how the Thessalonian churches suffered for their faith. We can maybe say all three of these examples. Our first point is, Proclaiming the gospel leads to suffering. Now, if we look down again to verse 13 to 15, it says, This is why we constantly thank God, because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is, the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea since you have also suffered the same things from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. Now, in many ways, Thessalonica and its people were very modern for their time. Similar to Brisbane, Thessalonica was a great success because of its location, especially because there was an excellent mix between land and sea, The city had great roads and connections to its ports, which allowed it to do business with Rome. Additionally, it had excellent natural resources. Rivers, rains, and fertile soil, fruit, grain, and fish were also plentiful. Wood was available for building houses and boats, and there were mines with gold, silver, copper, and iron. And just like in Brisbane, people who heard the gospel would have either received who opposed the gospel. Now we read in verse um, 13, this is why we constantly thank God. As a result of how much the believers responded to Paul, Silas, and Timothy's preaching when they were with them, they gave thanks. Keeping in mind that Paul wrote this letter when he was not with them. Paul was in Corinth at the time of writing this letter, since he was driven from Thessalonica, as we will see later tonight. In Paul's writing, these idol worshippers who had once been unbelievers in Christ have been saved. They have become Christians. And an abrupt 180 degree shift from what they once believed and how they once lived. Paul explained the magnificence of what Jesus did for them on the cross. And their eyes were opened and salvation followed. Paul is just making God, uh, Paul is just thanking God here in the opening sentence because they were saved. It follows 
Because when you receive the word of God, because when you receive the word of God that you heard from us, let's stop there for a minute. We see there, Paul's talking about us. He's talking about um, himself, Silas, and Timothy. And they were preaching. They were evangelizing the word. And essentially, they were sowing the word of God. Now, I'm not, yet, I'm not sure if anybody here are familiar with maybe starting a veggie garden. As uh, we went through COVID in the past year or two, I believe many uh, had a quick knot, maybe, yes. Because I think many in our church thought, <clears throat> well, if the toilet roll sold out, maybe the tomatoes would too. So let's start a veggie garden. And just last week, I again purchased a little tomato plant at Bunnings um, because I accidentally poisoned the previous one. Um, <laughs> And I've got some seeds lying around. Maybe you've got two. But here's the point. <laughs> they will not grow unless you plant and nurture them. And, but be careful. Not to, not to poison them, but be careful of the soil. You see, if you plant them in shallow soil, the seeds may quickly show promising signs. But soon, the sun will shrivel the leaves and the plant will die. Timothy, Silas, and Paul were evangelizing. And Paul tells us that here is Jesus' most famous parable actuated, taking place in real life. Here is what Jesus said, and here is how it plays out. This is the parable of the sower in action. There were four types of soil. Some fell on the path, some on shallow soil, some between thorns and thistles, and some in good soil. And, and the Thessalonian church received their seed, and they produced a good harvest in good soil. However, before I jump to conclusion, because that's actually a later point, the Thessalonians received, heard, and welcomed the word of God. They received, heard, and welcomed the word of God. It continues by saying, you welcomed it not as a human message. Human words are of little or temporary effect. Many powerful leaders around the world has recently phoned Russian President Putin and told him to stop his senseless war against the Ukraine. Our own politicians have been promising, blaming and campaigning lately, haven't they? It's election season, and while I'm not sure about you, a lot of the promises that I heard had a bit of a hollow ring to my ear. However, this is what Paul says. This is not a human message. It was God's word, and when they welcomed it, they were saved. Human words are mostly hollow, noisy gongs. But when we examine 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5, which we looked at a few weeks ago, you can actually just go to it in your Bible right now. Just scroll back a few few verses, it says that they welcomed it not as a human message. There's 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5. But our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. The, full, the following question is for you. Does God's word still convict you? Do you see it as just another book? I know that most of you here read your Bible on a daily basis, and that is, that's marvelous. But do you study it? How much time do you spend trying to soak it, in and fi- soak it in and figure out how it can be applied in your own life? In this instance, we see Paul saying that they have preached it, not just with word, but with power and the Holy Spirit. And we know it's... God's word, and God's word contains the word of eternal life, as we sang and heard earlier. The claims of the Bible are true because God is unable to lie. And that's exactly what Paul preached to the Thessalonians and what they evangelized. And it was God's word that they used because that's the very next section, and it reads, but as it truly is, the word of God. The main authority for Christians should be God's inspired, inerrant word. 
This understanding, I'm sure, was shared by the Thessalonians because due to their close relationship between Paul and Timothy that was with them, I am convinced, and we should not be surprised, if they also heard the following words that Paul wrote to Timothy at a different stage. He wrote in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17, All scripture is inspired by God, and it is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And that brings me to the observation that they did do good works, and they suffered as a result of them. For the verse says, which also works effectively in you who believed. As a result of their endurance through suffering of various trials, Paul knew that they were saved. They were not saved as a result of their suffering. I'll say that again. They were not saved as a result of their suffering for God. May it never be. We cannot be saved by our works. And this is also a point that Paul makes clear in another verse in in 2 Timothy 3 verse 1, a couple of months later after he wrote this first letter. So we in 1 Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, a couple of months later, Paul writes this, and it's related. We know that it was effectively working because Paul writes, in addition, brothers and sisters, he's still speaking to the same church of Thessalonica, in addition, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. So we know that God's word was effectively working in them. And this confirms also what we heard last week when Joe preached in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, as we saw, they were going to Thessalonica and it was not in vain because people were saved. How do, we, how do people get saved today? It's not by works. And it's not by angels flying around and hitting people on the head, even though that's what God could have chosen if he wanted to. No, it's rather through faithful believers like you and me and sowing the seed, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, telling unbelievers what Jesus did for me and what they did for them, for them personally. Which brings us to the section of of suffering. Has anybody here maybe suffered the loss of a friend or a colleague or a cousin or a niece or a job or maybe a child because... You were evangelizing the gospel. As we continue reading, we see that the Thessalonians believed in the gospel and then they were persecuted. Let's look at verse 14 and 15, the start of 15. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of Christ, uh, the imitators of God's churches in Christ, Christ Jesus that are in Judea. Since you have also suffered the same things from the people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. Now what, when these young believers faced suffering, how did they know what to think and what to do? They are young church and all of a sudden they are being persecuted. But they knew because they started imitating Paul, who would have told them how he suffered before coming to them, but more importantly, they started imitating the churches in Judea, which is Jerusalem. Even through suffering and even through persecution, they kept on sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, just like they saw Paul did. And they were willing to suffer for it because they would have received, heard, and welcomed the message that Paul preached to them, Jesus' own words in John um, 15 verse 18 to 20, it says, If the world hates you, you will know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. It because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute persecute you, and if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Similarly, in Matthew 5, verse 11 to 12, Jesus' sermon on the mount, we also clearly preached and told us to be a Christian is tough, and it will be tough. 
He said, you are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of, every kind of evil thing against you because of me. But be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you are under pressure, what emotions and reactions do you have? I know I have experienced anxiety and irritability when faced with, with some pressure. Maybe just a hard work. I, I'm wondering, how about you? But, but way worse than just worldly pressure from work or is being persecuted for your faith, tortured for Christ's sake. What emotions and reactions would you have? Would you still say, and would you still think, I'm blessed? Some of us will take the easy way out by denying Christ. Imagine a handful of believers in a city of five, 200,000 people and them being persecuted. I'm sure many of us will hide in a closet. The same was true in Thessalonica at the time of this writing. However, if, if we see someone walk and they're about to walk off a hundred feet, foot cliff blindfolded to their death, it would be extremely unkind. In fact, it would be cruel to not stop them. And it's out of love for the loss that we as Christians care, even if it means suffering. Sometimes it might appear cruel to not let a person just continue on their path of destruction, but the opposite is true. It's not cruel, it's love. Our willingness to suffer persecution is the result of the fact that he is a people loving God. I'll say that again. The reason we are willing to be persecuted by God hating people is because he is a people loving God. The gospel will be persecuted as long as we proclaim it. It appears that the Thessalonian Christians were resisting some of the Jews, and I want to stress this fact that not all Jews are, are bad. It was just some unbelieving Pharisee, um, Pharisees. The gospel was being prevented from spreading by these Jews. However, the Thessalonians continued to do so. To do so they continued to evangelize as Jesus had commanded. The Thessalonians would have also found courage in Peter's letter to them, in this very same letter, knowing that he is a fellow sufferer. And with our whole Bible, in hindsight, we know what Paul's attitude was towards suffering. We can see it in Philippians 3. He writes, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and considered them as done. And my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Would you be willing to follow that path? Does that mean anything? Does that, does that change anything for us here in Australia? Are you willing to be persecuted because of your faith? Do we share the good news of Jesus Christ with others? And do we share it? Often, The question is not if unbelievers will bend the knee to Christ, but rather when. If a person does not bow the knee before Christ, before dying, eternal wrath and condemnation will follow. And that is what we can learn from the unbelieving Jews in our next few verses as we move to our second point tonight. Resisting the gospel leads to wrath. That's the second part of verse 15 and 16. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone by keeping us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. And as a result, they are constantly filling up their sins to the limit and wrath has overtaken them at last. Paul accuses the Jews of murdering our Lord Jesus Christ here. But not just Jesus, but also the prophets like John the Baptist and among others, the three great Judean prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel we read this morning. They were all murdered by their own people. And that's the truth. The Jews was the cause of Jesus' death. Even though the Romans nailed 
Christ to the cross, it was the Jews, God's own people, his own na nation, the Israelites, who were responsible since they brought the case for Jesus to be persecuted. And they demanded his death. And as Paul wrote these words, I am sure he had no doubt, would have remembered that he also played a part, that he also played a role in the murder of Christians such as Stephen. Persecuting Christians was, after all, one of Paul's favorite pastimes before he became a Christian. But just, be, just, just imagine this. An unbeliever who is willing to live and let live and respect uh, and respect to, uh, I'll, I'll start over. An unbeliever who is willing to live and let live with respect to personal convictions regarding God is less dangerous to one who not only disbelieves himself, but he also tries to keep others from hearing the gospel. The unbelieving Jews in Thessalonica were of the latter part, the latter variety. They were active in trying to stop it. Three things that I want to highlight in, um, in our verse here. They displease God and are hostile to everyone. From what we observe in Acts, the Jewish community in many cities not only made an effort to keep Paul and his co-workers from speaking to the Gentiles, but they also managed to actually silence them on more than one occasion. So, so Paul is writing to the Thessalonians here, and he, and he says, God, Thessalonians, they're not just hostile to you, they're hostile to everyone. Many cities this is happening at. Hostile to everyone. But I think what Paul is saying even more, the more significant reason Paul is saying that they are hostile to everyone is because they were blocking the way to the hope of salvation which is stopping the message to spread to humanity. Because this is God establishing his church. It's still young. It's, it's still a, a young plant, if you want. And, and if you poison it, it dies. But it's God's plans, and they will not prevail. But these Jews were trying to stop the message to spread to humanity, and that is an attack on all men, on everyone, on humanity. They were filling up their sins to the limit. Just like their forefathers, these Jews were filling up their sins. And we can see what it means by listening to what Jesus teaches in Matthew 23, verse 31 to 32, where he condemned the Pharisees and he said to them, So you testify against yourself that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets? Fill up then the measure of your ancestors' sins. You snakes, you brood, brood of vipers. How can you escape being condemned to hell? Jesus, like Paul here, said, if, if you continue to fill up your sins, your day will come when God will judge you. And in fact, it is sure. Because Paul writes in, in the very next section, for wrath is overtaking them at last. And that basically means it's so sure that God's promise Eternal wrath will come that he speaks about it in a, in a past tense as if it already happened. Another great example is where we find God's eternal wrath being mentioned as if it already happened. I think many of you will be surprised. In a past tense is in the very famous John 3 verse 18. I will start with verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save them through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of of the one and only Son of God. And so we can see in the past uh, tense, as if, we can see this in the past tense as if it already happened and God's judgment is coming. Suffering in, is thus inevitable either for the Christians in this world or for unbelievers and for those who reject Christ in the next world. <clears throat> 
But oh, what joy awaits us. Heaven, eternal life, or glory for those who believe. Just imagine being with Christ. It will be so sweet to stand in awe of who he is and what he has done for us and, to be, and for the honor to be chosen as one of his children and then in some way being part of his great redemption story. And this brings us to our third and final point. Living the gospel leads to glory. Living the gospel leads to glory. This is verse 17 to 20. But as for us, brothers and sisters, after we were forced to leave you for a short time, in person, not in heart, we greatly desired and made every effort to return and see you face to face. So we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Now the, the word but here in verse 70 signals a discourse, a new topic marker. Paul says, in spite of the opposition, but, he's taking a discourse here, our intention was to return to you. And um, we see that in Acts 17 verse 10, Luke relates how the gospel messengers how Paul and Silas were obliged to leave the city by night. They were forced to leave the city by night in the shadow of darkness because of the rising movement against them. Something else we observe is that Paul describes the separation as feeling like they were torn apart because he was, he was um, forced to leave and flee in a sense. So he, he, he writes here, it was a feeling like they were torn apart, separated from the Thessalonians like a mother from her child. I'm not sure if, if you will agree, but there are not many emotionally painful experiences in life that can compare to the loss of a child. And this is the emotion that Paul is speaking of. The Greek word that they used, in fact, means to be orphaned. They were orphans to be orphans to be made orphans. I'm not going to try and pronounce that. He wanted to see them face to face as a mother would. And in some way, I wanted to also see my family in person. So they traveled to Australia with, and came to visit me. And it's such a joy to see them. Every parent from fathers to mothers would go to any length to see their children again. If you do not yet have children and if God allows, allows you to have children and you hold that little precious one in your arms, you will see how much less important other things all of a sudden becomes. And 1 Thessalonians 2 shows us, as we read last week, a bit earlier on if you go back, where Paul refers to himself as both the Thessalonians' mother and their father. We see in verse 7, to 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 7. I think in the Pew Bible it says um, the nurse is, was like a nurse nursing. But the better version of, of this sentence or this verse, <laughs> I think MacArthur agrees. He says, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. And then in verse 11 he says, as you know, like a father with his own children. So P Paul viewed the Thessalonian believers as his own spiritual children, and he said, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. I wanted to bypass that Satan hindered us initially, but the guy said, no, put it in. And we need to walk lightly here, because when things go wrong in our lives, it's easy to blame Satan or someone else. But we cannot. And in this particular case, Paul tried every means possible to actually return to Thessalonica, but he was unable to do so. Their desire to return was not merely a casual conversation, like, oh, I want to go to Italy one day. But rather, they made plans, and they had plans in place. But Satan foiled them. <clears throat> 
Satan stopped their plans. And that is what Satan does. When you try to advance the gospel, you will get pushed back. Ultimately, the battle was over the souls of the new believers in Thessalonica. And Satan wants any further progress to be stopped at all cost. And there's no, no way for us to know exactly what happened here. And not everything that goes wrong in our lives is Satan's fault. In fact, most of the time, it's our own sin that causes the problems. One possible explanation of for how Satan could have stopped Paul from going back to Thessalonica was through a legal guarantee that Jason and others in Thessalonica had provided so that Paul and his companion could not return. We see in Acts 17 verse 9, um, it, it tells us that after Jason and others paid a security bond, to release Paul and Silas, they were released. All that we know for sure is that the opposition was formidable enough to put an end to their best efforts to return and that Satan's opposition continued to cause them suffering. But that did not get pulled down for he has a greater guard, as we also do. Paul said in verse 19 and 20, For who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Now, while the church was their joy at the time of writing the letter, Paul here is actually expressing his hope and his joy that will occur when Christ returns. Our eternal hope is Jesus. I don't think Paul was confused about that. He's not saying, oh, you are our hope. He knows that Jesus is our hope. He implies that he hopes that his labor with the Thessalonians was not in vain. And even though the church is experiencing present fears, frustrations, and persecution, their hope is that the church will remain strong. Now, crown of boasting. In addition, Paul wrote about crown of boasting. And it's uncharacteristic, I think, for Paul to, for us to interpret this, that Paul says, oh, I brought these believers. It will be uncharacteristic for him to brag about something like that. Because all believers will receive the crown of life. I believe apostles may receive more. And it's probably more accurate here to, to read it as Paul anticipating that the church in Thessalonica should be united and stand firm when Christ returns, and then he will be humbled. He will be humbled because he was considered worthy to be part of their redemption plan. So not boasting in his own achievements. It will, however, be biblically sound to think that Paul is looking forward to receiving a crown of righteousness when Jesus returns, and, and they are able to present the Thessalonians church to the Lord. That's what they're talking about there. Now the greatest miracle this world has seen is the salvation of people that through the word of God and Jesus paying for our sins on the cross, that's the greatest miracle. And as Christians, how weird we might sound or how weird we might come across being a faithful child of God who is not afraid to suffer and share the gospel, to share this gift is an honor. And my question is, as we've heard this whole day, how will you respond? As we rejoice, celebrate, and thank God for every new believer that comes to our church, comes to Christ and other churches in our, in our city, across the country, May we continue to seek more opportunities to share the gospel, just like Jim Elliot, who wrote in his diary, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I think we've heard this many times. Yeah? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You are no fool to proclaim the gospel. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, 
I'm with you always, even to the end of age. And that is until he comes. I want to conclude with this example. When Sergei Kordakov was a member of the Russian secret police, he was like one of these Pharisee Jews we just read about who tried to stop the gospel from spreading. And I invite you to listen to the story of one of Sergei's victims, Natasha Zadar. I'm going to mispronounce this. Um, Natasha Zandano. No. That word just slipped my lips. So I'm going to say Natasha, as the, as the books say as well. One of his victims, Natasha. Natasha understood that Christ is coming again, and God's gospel is planted and grows through suffering. Sir J. Kordakov, in his autobiography, the persecutor describes how he used to be a Christian beater beating Christians. He was commissioned by the Russian secret police to raid Christian prayer gatherings and persecute believers with extraordinary brutality, inflicting terror and suffering upon Russian Christians. Now this story is about Natasha's suffering. Sergei wrote in his book, after the first time we caught and beat Natasha, I just thought, what a waste to be a believer. At some point, Victor, another police member, took the girl. He picked her up above his head and he threw her against the wall so hard that she hit the wall at the same height that she was thrown. Then she fell to the floor, semi-conscious, moaning. Victor laughed and he said, I bet that the idea of God flew out of her head. Sergei was shocked to see Natasha again three days later at another prayer meeting. Having caught her, they picked her up and threw her face down on a table. Sergei and her companion stripped her off her clothes and again started beating her. While biting her lip, she bit through her lower lip, trying not to cry while the blood was flowing down her face. They beat her so hard on her back repeatedly and first blisters formed and then flesh came off. And I will spare you the next three sentences. And not too long after that, at yet another meeting, Sergei was again astonished to see Natasha there. Several of the guys that was raiding the place also saw her in the distance, while Alex, another police member, moved towards her, filled with hatred. Sergei wondered, what makes her return to these prayer gatherings? As a club was raised above Alex's head, and just before she was hit, Sergei jumped in before him and he shouted, Get back. Get back, or I will let you have it, Alex. Alex responded, You want her for yourself, Sergei. Sergei yelled, No. She has something that we don't have. In the end, Natasha, a heroic Christian who suffered so much, was the instrument our God used to open Sergei's heart to the glorious good news of Jesus Christ. A few years later, Sergei wrote the following letter to Natasha, who he never saw again. Natasha, whom I beat terribly and who was willing to be beaten for her faith, I want to say, Natasha, largely because of you, my life changed and I'm a fellow believer in Christ with you. I have a new life before me, and God has forgiven me, and I hope you can also. Thank you, Natasha. Wherever you are, I will never forget you. You see, Natasha understood that Christ is coming, and God's gospel is planted through suffering, and it grows through suffering. What about us? How can we be used by God to spread His word, His gospel, regardless of the suffering, in order for Christ and His name to be glorified and for people to be saved. Maybe you have a rock like I have that flew through your window because you dared to tell some teenage kids in the park about Jesus and Him crucified. Maybe your child will experience the deadly grip of malaria when you go on a mission trip to Malawi 
Possibly you have been falsely accused and slandered in the church. Maybe you lost your job because of Christ. That is suffering. But that is how we grow. And while, while you eat, um, that is how we grow. Do you have any idea of how you will maybe sowing the seeds this week? May I encourage you to maybe invite a friend over, invite a, a neighbor or a co-worker or an old school friend. Make them some dinner and eat with them. Everybody needs to eat, right? And while you eat, share your testimony of how Christ saved you. The glory of the Lord is coming. And doing simple things like this is a small task compared to what the Thessalonians did. If you get shamed, if you get rejected, if you get persecuted, remember in Acts 5 verse 41, Luke wrote, they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they have been counted worthy to suffer. John Piper said this. Suffering is the only way that the world will really look and take notice of people who love their Savior so much that they are willing to suffer for Him, to join Him in His suffering. I'm going to keep that rock that flew through my window and I'm going to ask Jesus, what was that all about? And may I encourage you to also add to your rock collection. It's not that bad. It was worth it. And I'm sure Natasha and the first few guys we spoke about will agree. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for the Christians being persecuted around the world. And Lord, we pray specifically for the Geneva Presbyterian Church in California. Suffering, Lord, can sometimes feel so senseless. And Lord, use us for your glory. God of highest heaven, glorify your name for us and use us for your kingdom. Use us this week, Lord. Use us to sow some seeds. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In addiction we find in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12 and 13. <clears throat> May the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone, just as we do for you. May He make your heart blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all His saints. Amen.